Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and today I'm reviewing Teneris Adventures from Jagori Games. I reviewed Arena the Contest, the, the, the precursor to Teneris Adventures, Arena the Contest, over here. I reviewed that as maybe the third or fourth video I ever put up on this channel. When I first pulled out a camera, wanted to talk about board games, it was a game I happened to dive into around that time and was incredibly excited about just how much I enjoyed the experience. Uh, Arena the Contest is a game that is meant to be a skirmish head-to-head -head battling game that also came with a co-op mode and that's what I dove into, the co-op scenarios, and started playing through that and really loving what the game offered and I, I just fell in love with it right then and there. I've only played this game PvP, or I've only played Arena the Contest PvP a few times, most of my plays have been cooperative, diving into the, the scenarios and the campaign adventure, and Teneris Adventures sought to improve that system by taking what was amazing about that experience and making it amazinger, significantly more amazinger. And so I, I, I went ahead and backed this game because it was on Kickstarter and it was one of my favorite games, a game that I've fallen in love with and was offering a whole lot more, a giant campaign mode, epic, sprawling adventure, building on the good things about the game. We're going to get into all of that, timestamps as usual, to everything down below. And then I waited and I stopped playing Arena of the Contest. Not like stopped, stopped, but stopped pulling it out quite as much. Instead of playing Arena the Contest and really diving into it more, I was like, you know what, I'll just wait, because, you know, it's on Kickstarter, it'll be in a year, there's no rush at all. And so I proceeded to uh, play Arena the Contest maybe once or twice over the next year. And then I waited. And then I proceeded to play Arena the Contest again, once or twice over the year after that. It's been a game that I've been playing maybe once or twice a year, which is... Obviously, I mean, already it's not the worst, but it's not the best either for a game I love, while I patiently waited for Teneris Adventures to finally show up. And here it is, and I have uh, managed to get several games in when it first landed, then had to break for a bit, and I've been playing this game practically non-stop for the past week now. Diving into it every single day, having it set up on this table, just going through this experience, and finding all the things I love, and some things I dislike about what Teneris Adventures is. And with that way too long preamble out of the way, let's talk about Tenaris Adventures. Tenaris Adventures is a epic sprawling campaign game that is going to give you hundreds and hundreds of hours of content. By my personal gauge, which is not necessarily accurate, but my gauge, you're looking at somewhere in the range of 60 times 5, I think, uh, around 300 hours of content in this adventure. Possibly more depending on, you know, the dragons and the bosses and just how much you want to dive into it. But 300 hours of content or so, not in a single campaign. You see, a single campaign is going to be divided up into six weeks. A single campaign is going to give you a six-week arc, each week having I believe four, if I recall correctly, four missions you're going to dive into, alternating a mission or story phase, a mission or story phase, a mission, and then a world phase. I think I did that correctly. It's four missions. Mission, city, mission, city, mission, city, mission, world. Yeah, four missions, three cities, and one world phase in every single week that you go through. The missions are the core aspect of what you're going to be doing in the game. You're going to spend, you know, time going through stories and adventures and all that, but primarily as you go through it, you're trying to engage in this. What you see here on this table, this incredibly epic, amazing looking disclaimer, it does come with like the uh, walls and the legendary box. This is an all-in game that you're seeing in front of you. Make sure you understand what you're buying here, because if you bought this game, you would first of all need Arena of the Contest. This is not a game that stands on its own, you do need the original in the contest. Secondly, you'll need Terrace Adventures, and then thirdly, you'll need the legendary box of all the walls, plus any amounts of content for all the heroes, all the miniatures, all the monsters you might want to dive into, the dragons, the bosses, all that stuff. Now, in that journey, you're going through that six week arc, and you're going to go through around 20, 23. I have to double check the exact count. You're going to go through roughly 20 adventures in the game. The problem is this quest book we have over here. If we go through and grab this quest book, which is one of many books I'm going to be pulling out today, uh, this quest book comes with, let's pull this up over here. This, I believe it's 101 different quests to go through. Just page after page, I believe it's 100, 204 pages, 101 quests is where we leave off over here. That's the content you're getting in this quest book, but you're only playing through around 20 of them in any given campaign arc because of the nature of the choose your own adventure aspect. You see, the game is going to give you challenges that you go through, and if you replay it, you'll probably start off with the same few scenarios and then branch more and more as you go through it, but the game's going to give you these kind of challenges you have to choose what to tackle, but the problem is as time goes on, things are going to run out of time. If you had a bunch of things you're trying to do, you're trying to investigate the spies and stop the invasion, well, as time goes on, you can't do everything. So you make choices and slowly the game's going to tell you, hey, by the way, that invasion occurred because you didn't stop it. Those spies betrayed you because you didn't meet with them. That ship at the heart 
harbor blew up because you didn't talk to the alliance. So I'm making up most of the stuff, but like, it's just a whole bunch of things that will happen in the game experience. Time moves on as you go through it. But then more than that, when you do choose to barter with the Navy captains, you're still going to go on a bit of a choose your own adventure quest. That's where I pull out the next book over here. There's lots of books to go through over here. This particular book being the, so we have 204 pages in the last one. This book is 353 pages. So we got 353 pages in this giant book over here. And you can start making choices as you choose a quest to engage in. We have the uh, capital seashores over here. And you're going to start making choices as you read through over here. You know, you feel an immense necrotic energy coming from a necromancer. She is concentrating on casting a powerful spell that combines the bodies of dead merfolk with those of other sea creatures, creating those aquatic monstrosities. On a closer look, it's Solnertha, a chemist general you met in Fisherman's Wharf. There are many undead in the way protecting her. You also see merfolk soldiers fighting nearby. Do you signal to the merfolk and charge Solnertha? Or do you try to sneak behind the enemies to get to Sol Solnertha? As you go through these quests, it's going to have different impacts. Damage you take along the way, things you unlock, little check marks you make. You're going to have your own little uh, sheet that you're marking with things you're doing as you go through this. You're going to be marking your accomplishments, your quests, your masteries, a whole bunch of things as you go through it. But then, sometimes it results in different quests, or not sometimes... Most of the time, it results in different quests that will be options on the table. Sure, you went to go negotiate with the sea captains over there, but maybe you alternatively end up engaging in a battle with the sea captains, or maybe you smuggle aboard a ship and end up on a whole different island and set up an entirely different board that you go through. That's how you're going to have 101 different quests that you can go on, but ultimately only playing through around 20 of them in any given scenario, giving you a ton of replayability to that campaign. As far as those 20, I've been estimating that the game is around 3 hours per session estimating it depends on how you play it depends on how aggressive you are how think you are i like to think through things i go through uh, and for me a three-hour session means about half an hour or so of rule book reading and set up and I, when i say rule book reading, i should rephrase that as as going through an encounter a story an adventure and then setting up the board is around half an hour and then two and a half hours per session that i set up to actually go through it and play i think your times will vary wildly that's been my own experience as i go through this because i like to take my time and think through the perfect options I go through it, which means you have 20 missions or whatever. Oh, and also the city phase. You also have the city phase as well, so it could be even more, but that means you're looking at around 60 hours for a campaign, and because you're only seeing a fifth of the content, that's around 300 hours of content before we dive into the variabilities that you have on the table. Past that, what's actually happening? So you have a story phase, you have choices, you have choose your own adventure, you have this brand, grand, grand branching story arc that you're going through, but past that, and by the way, can we just talk about the fact that they give you 101 quests and you only see 20 of them in the campaign? That's all. And then you replay and try again and see things that are going on. Like, there's a ton of content in this game. And again, before we dive into any offshoots and dragons and bosses and all those things. As far as the actual game on the table, the game on the table involves you having four heroes. Four characters that you're going through, you're going through the game with. And after you go through the story phase, after you set up the board, you have your four heroes. They start somewhere, and they start wandering around the board trying to take down the various enemies. That's where I'm not going to be going into a full rules overview here at all. I cannot possibly do so. The rule book is 80 pages long. Yes, in addition to all the content they have, the 350 pages of quest content, the uh, 200 pages of, of scenario set up. They also have, oh, we haven't even talked about the city book. Let's go through the city book. The city book is, uh, let's see, the city city book over here is another, so we're at, what, 550 pages of content, and the city book is another 90 pages, another 85 pages, so we're at 630 pages of explorable, interactive content with puzzles and adventures and, and logic things and, story, and characters you're talking to, and then another 80 pages of rule book on top of that, so there's a... There's a whole lot of reading to go through, some of it homework, and some of it just enjoyable, fun times. But past that, so you go through that, you set up, you engage with this adventure over here, and then you start taking down the baddies. You see, in the game, what you're going to be doing is your heroes are going to be activating. You're going to take a hero, you're going to activate them, and you're going to move around, attack, and whatnot. And in the course of the game, you have a primary action, you have a uh, movement, and then a primary action. So you can move around the board and take interactions, you know, uh, interact with objects, just use your movement points, sidestep to get out of, co out of combat and danger as you need to. But then you can also go ahead and take a primary action, which could be more movement, but more often than not is going to be you taking an attack. You see, you're going to have this hand of cards in the game. You're going to have a hand of cards where you're going to be playing a card in order to, well, you're going to be having a character, and then you're going to be playing a card, either a one-time special that you only have two of, and once you use them, they're gone. Or alternatively, you have four cards that will be rotating in play, these four other cards. They'll give you specific abilities with unique characters. Have we talked about the fact that there are eight different classes to go through? I think it's eight. I'm pretty sure it's eight. Eight different classes to go through in the game that give you their own little feel and taste to the way they play and specific things to them, including their skill boards, which I don't think are called skill boards. They're called something else 
if I recall correctly. Something else boards. But you're going to have some degree of classes, but then also characters within those classes. So you have each class has, uh, depending on how much content you have, anywhere from like, you know, two or three to seven or eight different heroes per class, giving you something like 50 to 60 heroes in the game that you can explore with. And you're choosing four of those heroes. And then you're going to have your hand of cards that represent their partially uh, partial cards related to their class and partially their own unique cards, including their own unique specials and their own unique trigger as far as what happens that triggers a one-time benefit that they can utilize, giving you a ton of ways you can engage with the system. But as you do so, eventually you'll start attacking enemies. When you attack an enemy, the enemy will react and start attacking back. They have their own AI cards with their own initiative, their own way they operate, everything listed over here. And these enemies are no small deal to deal with. This is not your typical, you know, hordes of zombies to deal with in a scenario that you just wade your way through. These are important, dangerous enemies that will take up your time, effort, and attention, coming to the table with 50 to 70 to 80 to health for them, giving you a ton of time that you have to sit there and take them down slowly but surely. Keep in mind, your own characters are starting with a similar amount of health, you just hopefully have more options and tactics at your disposal, and you have a ton of options and tactics at your disposal. You see, as you play through the game, you have your skill boards. Your skill boards, again, giving you your own system over here. As enemies die, you're going to be earning mana cubes that are going to be used to trigger these skills. You're going to be triggering these various skills. You'll have different levels of those skills as you go through it. And you're trying to take actions both on allies' turns, on enemies' turns, all with the goal of trying to figure out what's the right combination that results in you being able to clear a room with them taking as few damage, well, with you taking as little damage as possible, and the enemies taking as much damage as possible. It's also worth noting, this is a partially fictional map over here. So if you're looking through this one, this is not an actual scenario it's based on a scenario and i threw extra things in there but then past that you're trying to figure out all the combinations of abilities the combination of cards the combinations of specials when to use your specials they're incredibly impactful and many of the specials give you an ongoing benefit you know you go ahead and cast that special and suddenly the enemies are taking extra damage every single round because you used it early but alternatively maybe you want to save it for the final boss because those final bosses in every single adventure they have a ton of health they hit hard they hit quickly and they often have something game breaking that makes you wonder how am i supposed to win but you can with tactics, with planning, with trying to sit there and math things out. I mentioned I like to take my time, and I like to take my time because I understand all the dynamics at play, and a big part of this game system is trying to figure out how to manipulate the enemy's AI. For better and for worse, we're going to talk about that. You're going to go through that entire adventure, and every adventure so far that I've played through has felt distinctively unique there's overlap of course you're going through you know you're clearing room you're dealing with the monsters there's a degree of the same feel to the overall structure of what you're doing but there's often different rules in play for every scenario that i've gone through and i'm i'm about halfway through my first campaign right now and that's about 30 hours or so into this experience and uh, there's a ton to go through so take everything i say with a grain of salt here because there could be you know who knows how much duplicate or similarities similarities as we go through it but for right now, almost every mission I've played through has felt distinct in the fact that they give you the core system at play, but then they give you different aspects to how that scenario plays out that gives you a compelling puzzle, that gives you something that makes it feel different, it makes it stand on its own and not feel like just another mission, just another mission. The games feel distinct as you go through them. And when you're done with all that, you're going to pull out this sheet over here. We have this over here. We're going to pull out this over here because when you're done with your scenario, win or lose, you're going to go through the... Uh, well, win or lose has different consequences depending on how you go through it. Let's say you win over here. You're going to go through your city phase over here. The city phase, you're going to be pulling out this map. Yes, it's not the best considering the, the premiumness of everything else we have going on here. And you're going to go through a management phase here where you're trying to recruit new characters into your deck. You're trying to build new buildings and you're trying to gather more resources so you can craft more items. This is where you manage everything that's going on. And don't let the, uh, the map fool you here. The map does not look the best, but the puzzle phase itself, the city phase itself is rewarding to go through it because you have the characters you have your little characters you have in the game you have a set of npcs that you start with and you're going to be building out that character deck as you go through the experience and it's going to give you more and more and better cards all while you're trying to manage the strength of your buildings the abilities those buildings give you weeding out your deck so you can reliably pull the best cards possible while ensuring you're keeping all your things in play and the rule does a great job of kind of illustrating to you well if you let this you know slide you're gonna have to deal with that if you let that slide you have to deal with that but you are working with limited resources so you're gonna have to let something slide and then eventually at the end of a week 
you'll have the world phase instead. The world phase is an opportunity to try to get extra points into your masteries, which are going to unlock these various perks, which are very fun to go through because there are these at different levels, there's three levels of perks as you slowly unlock them and trying to ramp up your masteries to get that third level perk is going to give you more game breaking abilities, which are going to be essential because the game is leveling up with you. The enemies are getting stronger, stronger. The game is getting harder. The bosses are getting worse and more daunting. And as you go through the game, there's this kind of difficulty adjustment system called the Kemet Hunt. The idea that the Kemet, who are these enemies you're going to be dealing with in the game, that as you have, as you go through games without having to rely on these handicaps, effectively first aid and dying heroes and all that, as you go through the game without having to rely on these things that give you a way of getting out of jail when, you know, things are looking tough for you, then you're going to level up your Kemet Hunt, which is going to add to the amount of loot you draw every game, so it gives you a little bit more control over your city phase, but the downside is you have more enemies on the board. The upside is that acts as difficulty modulation. That acts as, hey, if you're taking your time, if you're figuring out a way to actually make it through without having to rely on those, you know, first aid tokens that help you when the heroes die, well then great, good for you. Also, here's more enemies on the board because apparently you're good enough at this game that you need that adjustment. And then as you find yourself having to use first aid because you're dying, you'll start moving down your Kemet Hunt. So it acts as a minor difficulty adjustment that is not overpowering on what it does. It operates in small phases, small adjustments, but the game already, no matter what you do, feels like a struggle, feels like a challenge, but it's up to that little Kemet Hunt to give you that small adjustment to, to work within the boundaries of what you're bringing to the table. And you're going to rinse and repeat. Go through a week. Go through another week go through another week, slowly unlocking elements of the story, slowly interact interacting with the world around you in different ways, because again, an absolute ton of content here, which does mean you're going to have to be making choices about what exactly is and isn't working for you, or what choices you're making, what, what aspects of the story and the campaign and the characters are working with. And then there's a ton more that I'm just not able to dive into just because of how long it would take to properly explain everything going on here. I will say you're able to add characters as you go through it. So you mentioned that, you know, there's 50, 60 characters in a roster. Well, you don't have to play through the campaign 15 times to try all the 60 characters because as you go through the game, you have the ability to unlock more heroes and add them to your deck to, to put them more heroes in play so you can mix things up. You can get used to the fact that you have a particular healer and brute and tank that you like, but maybe you mix in a shooter or maybe you mix in a, a you know, I don't know, a brute or whatnot. I said brute a controller. You can mix in different roles in play so you can have different experiences or even just different characters within the same role. Maybe you really like it, having a healer class, but you mix in a different healer to give you some a different element of how you're going to manage things in the game. And so you are able to experience more and more characters as you go through the game. Yes, you'll have your starting four and you might go attach to them or maybe not. Maybe you find you proxy one in and you fall in love with the way that class plays, but throughout the course of a campaign, it's up to you just how far you want to stretch and engage, but you have the opportunity to try to focus on maybe four to ten heroes, or if you really just want to go crazy you can probably play as all 50 maybe not all 50 you can probably play as a lot of heroes if you're really trying to for myself i personally have enjoyed leaning into those four and slowly branching out trying different ones while keeping the same class so i kind of add a new one and then proxy one out and slowly working away around a build and characters that i've really enjoyed but you're also leveling them up and getting to see different elements of those characters you go through it so no two experiences are the same and i think at this point we'll start diving into actual reviews and opinions now that we've talked about what this game is bringing to the table we haven't even talked with the, the fire, the spikes, the terrain elements, all the management, but maybe we'll talk more about it as we got, dive into the review. And to that end, let's talk about the game. Let's start off with... Hmm, it's not my usual format, if you've noticed. I'm a little... I don't have any notes. I'm just diving into this just based on the fact that I spent the past week heavily engaged with this game every single day. There's a lot to like here. There's a lot to like. But let's start off with the complaints. Let's start off with the complaints, and there's going to be a bunch of them. Understand, as I go through it, there's going to be a bunch of complaints. They don't detract from my enjoyment of how much I like this game in a meaningful way, and we'll get into final thoughts as well, but let's talk about the complaints first. The first is the 80-page rulebook. I'm not afraid of an 80-page rulebook. They are what they are. I am afraid of 80-page rulebooks that find themselves as technically written and as dense as this one is. This is not an easy-to-absorb 80-page rulebook. I mean, you can go, first of all, beautiful illustrations across the board as you go through it. So they do give you that little, you know, things you can see as you go through. But uh, if you read this rulebook, it is not 
the easiest. Look at that. Listen, I'm sorry. I'm just, the art's incredible. If you read this rule book, it is not the easiest experience to go through. Not in the slightest. This is not an 80 page rule book that feels like you just start reading and make your way through it. This is an 80 page rule book that is a reference manual. Now, to its credit, by the way, it has an amazing index in the back here, which has been utilized time and time and time again by me. I would use that index an absolute ton to go through things as I double check and triple check and look through that thing that I've done 14 times, but I just need to understand all the things going on. That is a reference manual and is a chore to get through. Now, the game does have a kind of a tutorial system that where they kind of introduce you to things one at a time like hey take this card and do this and move your way through there i thought it was an absolute mess i understand it now like where i am now i finally understand it all but diving into the game i felt it was incredibly confusing and and it's worth noting as a disclaimer i am coming to this game understanding and knowing how to play from tenaris from reading the contest which gives me a lot of the toolkit to understand how to play this game, but also might handicap me a bit as I find myself mentally trying to fit this into that system. So there is that disclaimer that I'm coming at it from a different angle, which might affect things. I don't think it does. I just think it's a bad tutorial. I think it is not a simple streamlined system because what you do in the game is you have an adventure card and then you read the adventure card and the adventure card references you to go, this is the sequence you go through. Okay, ready for the sequence? This is the typical sequence you go through. Let me, I don't even have the card. They're all set away. Do I grab a card? Let's not grab a card. Let's pretend that this is an adventure card. It's not. It's a quest card. But let's pretend it's an adventure card. So I take an adventure card. I look at the adventure card. And the adventure card says, okay, great. We're going to go over here. And we're going to go find the adventure. So we're going to find the adventure. The adventure is going to be in the journal. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to flip to the journal to that specific adventure. When we're done reading the journal, we're going to go ahead and go through a whole sequence in an arc. And now we're done with the journal, right? So we close the journal. We are good to go. The journal is closed. We went to the journal because we went to the adventure card. The adventure card told us where to go. The adventure card says to go to the journal. Journal goes ahead and open that. We put the journal aside, and now we open the quest book. When we open the quest book, we're going to go ahead and grab the quest book. Now, the quest book's going to go ahead and specifically direct us because the journal, the journal told us which quest to go on. So we go find the quest, and we set up the quest. Now we get, now that we set up the quest, we go back to the journal, but not the first half of the journal. No, the first half of the journal is for finding the journal. The second half of the journal is where we go to find the quest. Now we're reading from the journal and the quest book. We're no longer referencing the adventure card. The good news is that part's done. The bad news is now we're done with this whole thing, and then we do we go there. Now we're done with that. We're probably going to be referencing the city book at different points in time after we make notes of the the different marks we've gotten on our progression now this all on its own is not even the worst that's what a standard quest situation looks like in Snares adventures and i've gotten it down pat and i don't even mind it past the table space it takes but when you're learning the game you're doing all of that but inter intermittent with everything else, you are also being told to then go ahead and take a break from that one thing you did to read like, you know, three and a half pages of rules and then go to the next step and then read another three and a half pages of rules. They try to give you like the 80 page rule book in two and a half, three page chunks while you're cross checking between different areas. Now, again, I understand it all now. It's golden. It's clean. It's clear. It is messy when you are learning the game. This was a chore to learn and it is partially based on my love of the Tenera system of the arena of the contest that let me let me close this thing over here this is large by the way it, it partially based on my love of the system and knowing how much treasure there was here to unlock it had me pushing through it but it was certainly not an easy game to dive into off the bat there are multiple systems at play as you go through it and that is a barrier to entry that anyone diving into this game is going to have to deal with it does not in any way affect my enjoyment now Right now, I love the game, I love the system, we'll get into that, that was a barrier I had to get past, and now I understand it, but it is a barrier you will be signing up for if you choose to play this game. The thing that does minimally get in the way of my enjoyment now is there's a lot of rules, and you kind of have two choices when you play Tenaris Adventures. Choice number one is you simply never reference the rulebook, or as minimally as possible, and you play the game, and whenever you're uncertain, you make a judgment call, and then once in a while, allow yourself to check a rule, so that you make sure that as you're playing the game, you are playing the game, and that's the most and biggest important thing to do. There's a ton of things that you could reference. The core system is very streamlined. The core idea of what's happening, they have a six page kind of how to play guide because you know, if we didn't have enough reading material, we have another little reading material over here. This is a six page guide that will give you all the, like the way the enemies interact and how everything works. And it gives you 97% of the information in a pretty accessible form. The problem is it's the other 3%, the other 97%. The other 3% is what takes all the rulebook referencing. The other 3% of what does the enemy react in what situation? How does it do this here? What happens if you do this? What happens if you interrupt that attack there? The core gameplay loop is very easy to understand. It's the exceptions that take all the referencing again and again and again until you get it down pat because there's so many ways things can play out. 
This is a game that I have not done a playthrough yet. I will probably, I will probably try to do a playthrough at some point because I, I want you to see it. I want you to see this game because I want to share it with you. I'm also nervous to do a playthrough because right now I'm here doing a review and as soon as I do a playthrough, there's going to be 700 mistakes on camera that I've made because I have not played this game accurately once. Not once. And you'll be like, oh, you know, Alex, review that game and he's got this many mistakes. Yes, I definitely have that many mistakes. I have never played this game accurately. I've played this game mostly accurately, forgetting a million things, probably doing about 4,000 things wrong, and I'm okay with that because the core experience I've gotten from it has worked for me. But there are mistakes to be made, there are rules you have to reference, and it doesn't really detract from my experience that much. It does a little bit, but for the most part, it is something you want to be mindful as you dive into this game. This is a game that's going to be, rule that's going to be prone to not necessarily catching and understanding every system, but then also, even if you do, just missing things because of how much there is going on in this game. There are times when I check the rule book to make sure I did it right, and there's times where I just move forward, pretty darn sure I did something wrong, and not caring because I'd rather have a good time, and the game is currently giving me a good time, and trying to ensure that I did the exact interruption sequence and moved the exact enemy the right way and possibly did or didn't do that, it all works for me there. So those are two things to be mindful of off the bat. There's small other nitpicks. There's different things that kind of uh, affect my enjoyment. First of all, I do not like the paper map. That little uh, paper map over here, wherever it is, it's lost at this point. It's down at the bottom. This, in a game that feels incredibly premium, this map over here feels like Tenaris Dragori. Can we get a um? Can we get something you can buy over here that's nicer than this? That's just like the same size as a regular board. This is basically the same size as a regular board. Maybe make it a bit smaller so it can fit in the uh, the inlay. I don't know the exact size, but this just doesn't feel like premium when you have an incredibly premium experience that is over the top in so many different ways. And we have this map that is um, just that little extra thing there. But past that, that all works. One thing you might be bothered by that I'm certainly not is the enemy reaction system. You see, the enemies in the game, they have a system of who they target. They target the person with the most health, and the least health, the furthest away, the most mana cubes. They have a whole priority system in play that you're going through. And that means that you do 100% frequently in this game. You have a little situation where I go ahead and I wander up to this person over here and I hit them in the face and I smash that guy. And then he proceeds to walk past me, stepping on spikes, taking reaction damage from walking away from me, only so that he can then attack somebody else. And he just sat there and did 10 damage to himself so that he could ignore my attack attack, react to my attack, and attack another person. That happens a lot in the game. And thematically, that might bother you. It doesn't bother me at all. In fact, I love it. I adore the system in, in Tenaris Adventures. I love how it operates, but you might find it to be thematically a disconnect. That you smash an enemy in the face, and then he walks through a ton of damage to hit somebody else instead. To me, that's the core of where the puzzle lies. Thematically, I don't really care. I can make arguments for or against it thematically, but ultimately, that's what gives this game room to breathe. That's what gives this game the, the opportunity to feel special as you look through all the ways to manipulate way too many things going on on the table and trying to figure out the patterns of how you can have a system work against itself to your advantage, which is essential because of how strong the enemies otherwise are as you go through the game. It might bother you. It really doesn't bother me. In fact, it's one of the strengths of the system. But understand that before you walk into this game, that is the core puzzle you're solving here. How to make the system work against itself, which you might sit there and think, well, that means dumb enemies. No, it means enemies with a different priority system than you, and you're trying to play a board game. You, If you want, like, I don't know, there's other games if you want something different. That This is what the game gives you over here. I will say one thing I don't love again, and this is one that, this probably bothers me more than any other complaint I've mentioned until now, which is, in the Kemet Hunt system, the first Kemet Hunt level, meaning it's an iterative system that spawns more enemies, but the very first level is you lose one of your special attacks, which which is half the fun. Like, you, like I don't mind. Throw more enemies in my face. I don't care. I want to cra cast that giant fireball that's going to send, you know, sparking meteors off into the distance and target everyone. The special attacks are one of the coolest things in the game, and the first level of difficulty modification is, hey, you know those cards that are super cool that you only get to use one per scenario? You can't use them anymore. I want to house rule around that. I haven't yet. I haven't house ruled around it, but I want to house rule around it. I want to come up with some other difficulty modification system because I despise the fact that the first difficulty modifier is have less fun and feel less cool. 
I like it when you give me more things to overcome. Don't take the fun away from me. Again, I hope, and I haven't even looked on Board Game Geek. I'm going to go on Board Game Geek. I'm going to find someone who has the same problem with me, who's found a good system, and I'm going to use that instead because I do not like feeling less cool, and the special attacks are so freaking cool. Speaking of special attacks and stuff like that, the last complaint I have, I think the last complaint I have, is the fact that as you grow your characters, you have your character who's kind of a mix of their own unique character and then their 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 role. That's the, the the system you have going on. Your own unique character brings things to the table. It brings two basic attacks, it brings two special attacks, and it brings their own character card that has their own way that they react. Strictly speaking, the way they react is the same. It's what they do when they react that's different per character. It'll make sense if you know the game. And to that end, if you are playing with the Kemet Hunt, you've already lost your special attack, or one of them, so now you're down to one special attack and two basic attacks, and the problem is, as you level up, the game system incentivizes you to utilize other cards from your role that are stronger instead of your own cards, which means by the time you're done leveling up your cards, your character is about 90% their class and 10% of their character, instead of at the beginning where it's 50-50. And that does mean that as you play through the game at higher levels, a shooter, which is a class role, a shooter, two different shooters are going to feel 90% the same at a higher class role, whereas they start off feeling actually pretty different. And I wish the leveling up system allowed the characters to feel differentiated as themselves more, which would enhance replayability. Now make no mistake, this game has plenty of replayability and plenty going for it, but I really wish that system were adjusted. Again, Gregory, I hope that in some way, shape, or form, something is, give us more class cards, level up cards within the characters, or maybe card text that has some sort of modification, so your level 1 card for your class just gets stronger as you're doing a level 1, level 2, level 3, you'd have to track it somehow, I don't know the exact system. All I know is, as your characters level up, they feel less and less like themselves. They're less and less unique and more and more class-based, and that's the last complaint I have. And now that we're done with complaints, let's talk about what we like, what I like. There's no we here. I love the system. I love Tenaris Adventures in general. I love it, you know, the contest in general. I love that system. And everything about this, almost everything about this is better. The, the, initial, the initial mental load is the harder part. The amount of rules to go through to understand it is the harder part. Everything else is simply better. This game gives me all the things I loved about Tenaris Event, Arena of the Contest. I'm always going to get confused. This game gives me all the things I loved about Arena of the Contest. It gives me an incredibly intricate system that gives you a lot of puzzles to go through. If you've watched my reviews, if you've watched my content, I love a good puzzle. I love feeling like there's a set of constraints at play that I'm trying to solve. And this game gives that to you in absolute droves between the characters, between the board, between the way the map's set up, between your, your different classes over here, between the ways you're going to be trying to figure out how to take advantage of the enemies, between the fact that you then, when you're done with all of that, you then dive into a city phase that gives you its own little puzzle of how, how, to, like, how to solve that puzzle. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to gather more NPCs? Are you trying to level up your buildings? They both have their strengths. Leveling up your buildings is going to give you better, stronger cars. That's going to let you get through the system a little easier and deal with that increased Kemet hunt. And the, dealing with the increased Kemet hunt means you have more loot cards coming in, which means you have to spend less resources over there, but then the problem is you also need to be mindful of the fact that you have to have a hard, tighter, harder game. You have Choose Your Own Adventure in that journal. That journal gives you a fun degree of, churn, of Choose Your Own Adventure. The writing it varies in terms of how good it is or isn't. It doesn't bother me. Overall, I do get a sense of the story, of the background, of things going on. This game gives me a decent amount of world building, a ton of choose your own adventure, a compelling city phase that I have to manage my resources to actually stay ahead of the curve, and then this, the center puzzle where you spend the bulk of your time, is just so rewarding and invariably different game to game. The specific quests I've gone on have, again, have all felt like there's a different system at play, for better or for worse, because they all give you a little kind of rules over you of here's the thing that's happening here's this new little puzzle you're trying to solve you have to go ahead and destroy those statues you have to be mindful of that person running around the edge of the board and you have to be very wary of the fact that as you do these things the hostages are slowing you down they all give you different puzzles using the same basic system and different degrees of just how much is going on here it is an intricate system with a ton of powers and abilities a ton of things to manage and a ton of opportunities to feel intensely clever as you combo things left right and center there's one particular mission that i mean i felt a little stupid after but there's one particular mission that had a time clock and things were running out and I basically said hey you know this time clock it starts on six and then 
it counts down every single round if you don't take out these statues in play. And the problem is you can kill, you can rescue those hostages, which will give you two more time for a maximum amount of eight time. And by the way, the extra challenge in this adventure, every single adventure has extra challenges. The extra challenge is to end on eight time. And so I walked into that adventure and I was like, okay, great. So basically I have to lose no time the entire game. I have to get the extra hostages and lose no time. This is going to be an impossible puzzle to solve, but I'm going to do it. And I did. I figured out ways to combine the characters, to use my things, to get those extra mana cubes, to immediately take down those orbs and stop the time clock from drifting, and I was able to do it, and then I walked into the next room, and the next room said, you gain four time. And I was like, oh, I actually I actually had, didn't have to be as strict as I was, but whatever. And then I managed to go ahead. Then, don't get me wrong, the then boss then came along, and the boss is terrible, and he depleted his time tokens every single round, and so I actually only ended up with nine time, and so I did get the extra challenge, but only by the most bare left margin left over, but the game gives you those opportunities. It gives you opportunities to sit there and say, I'm going to use that ability over here to move that enemy too. I'm going to use my own basic attack to go ahead and target you, which is going to have you walk and close the distance. And now I have four enemies in a small little three by three square, and I'm going to cast a giant fireball, basically killing two of them, giving myself more mana cubes. And now that's the enemy's turn, they're reacting. I'm going to go ahead and trigger that and do two extra attacks against you and take you out and clear the board. The game gives you those opportunities to feel clever, and it gives you the variability of the scenarios and the her heroes and the characters and and the enemies to just constantly keep you on your toes as far as how you approach the adventure and when you think you have it all solved you walk into room and there's a final boss who's smacking you down with attacks that deal 30 damage and also run down the clock as you go every single second the game just gives you a lot of ways if you like dungeon crawlers if you like if you have powers and abilities, if you like variability, if you like a puzzle, this game is an excellent experience across the board that I absolutely adore. And everything they added in Tenaris Adventures just made it better. The choose your own adventure keeps me more invested. The little mini games you go and puzzles, there's logic puzzles. I haven't talked about that. There's, they've added all these logic puzzles you can go through. I've sat there, I spent this, I, I think it was, was it today? I don't remember what it was, but I, I spent, I, I don't know, 35 minutes trying to solve a numeric equation of how everything lines up to be trying to figure out, well, this piece is together, that, and that equals that. Therefore, th this line does not equal seven, and that line must equal six or seven, but this is a two. I spent a half an hour playing a numbers game with miniatures sprawled on the table in front of me because I needed to solve that thing. So I then go ahead and do that thing. And if I didn't, did it matter? Not at all. But I felt clever doing so while engaged in the choose your own adventure. And then they added all that to the game. They added the city phase. They've added more content. They've added these class rules. They just added so much to a game system that I already loved. I think this is an excellent game. I think it's a lot of fun. They've also updated the miniatures. And that's another thing. I really like this game, which means I think it's a good time to talk into, but final thoughts. I wrestled a bit with the rating on this one, and I will say, take ratings with a grain of salt. Because there's a lot that I can complain about here. And and this is where, I'll, I'll just save you time. To me, this is a 5 out of 5. This is an absolute 5 out of 5 in terms of the experience it gives, in terms of the fact that I, I adore this game, I love it, it's absolutely in my top 10, I don't think it's a question at all, I spent so much time this week in this game system and I'm ready to continue spending more, it's just a lot of fun. I wrestled briefly with the numeric rating aspect, and this is where I take things with a grain of salt, because I really do think that the initial cognitive load is a lot. I think like calling a 5 out of 5, that's a perfect game. No, it's not a perfect game. Nothing's perfect. A uh, rating to me is, uh, to me a rating system is not about perfection, not in the slightest. This is not perfect and I want you to hear the complaints because the complaints are there. This is a game that you have to sign up for as a homework assignment. You have to power through it. Very similar to Too Many Bones, a game that I think is incredible and amazing and I recommend but is a lot to take on initially. This game has that same problem, arguably worse because it's just 81 pages. I was 81, I don't remember exactly. I should know by now. I spent so much, so much time reading this. We have, what do we have? It's um, 86 pages, I was off, 87 pages, 87 pages of rulebook content that is not the easiest to go through and has a whole section on how to read the different colors and ultimately you're just going to read them all anyway so it doesn't really matter. There's a lot going on, there's a tutorial phase that is not the simplest to understand and go through. By now I have it down but I didn't at first. There's a ton, oh we haven't even talked, we haven't even talked about all the funds and masteries and perks and things you'll unlock there, there's a whole different system. There is a definite, there are definite things about this game that make it possibly not a game for you. But I'm mostly past those. And the experience it's giving me is amongst the best games in my collection. Absolute top 10. Uh, it, it, this game has, since I first played Arena of the Contest, it hasn't left my top 20. It's been in my top 20 every single year since I've played it. 
And Tenaris Adventures only elevates that experience. It does add more cognitive load. It does add a degree of frustration on the initial trying to understand how everything works. But once you do have it down, it is simply a better game for it. So for me, this is a 5 out of 5. That does not mean it does not have complaints. It just means that it's good enough that the complaints don't stop how much I like the game. And with that, as far as other game recommendations, other game recommendations, first of all, I mentioned already Too Many Bones. If you like the puzzle that is Too Many Bones, if you found the rulebook a lot but also thought it was worth it, this is very much a game system that I absolutely recommend that I think is going to give you the same highs, the same puzzly feel with a very different system behind it and a ton going on. If you had to ask me which game I like more, I don't have that answer right now. We'll talk about it next year when I do my top 100, but right now I just don't know. And if you're looking for another dungeon crawler that is an absolute ton of fun, and yes, I We'll have a review at some point, but Massive Darkness is going to give you a lot of fun, a lot of powers and abilities, and a much, much simpler and easier game to understand with less depth and reward, but a whole lot easier to jump into and tons of fun miniatures and all those fun things as well. Massive Darkness 2 Hellscape more specifically. And with that, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Hope you found this video helpful. And as always, I hope you have a good one. And also at some point, I'm going to be doing some sort of roundup of Frosthaven versus Oathsworn versus Teneris versus Isopharion. Maybe Massive Darkness 2? Don't know. It's not really a campaign game, but it does have a campaign. We'll see. Maybe I'll throw that one in there. In any case, until next time, I hope you have a good one.